Today, we're taking a look at something of an anomaly, an early interwar aircraft built by Blackburn that was actually fairly successful. Now, I know Blackburn is a bit of a running joke in many aviation circles, but to their credit, they often built weird and wonderful aeroplanes because they were thinking outside the box rather than sniffing on fumes. But the Kangaroo was more of a conventional design, and that, more than anything else, is probably why it fared a bit better. Now recently we looked at the short-lived Blackburn GP, which was a twin-engine float plane that was intended for long-range bombing and naval patrol. The Kangaroo was an offshoot from this aircraft, but its design and eventual use was different enough from the Blackburn GP to, in my mind at least, warrant its own video. Unfortunately, not a huge number of photos or drawings are available of this aircraft, so if this video feels a bit like a glorified PowerPoint presentation, I apologise in advance. The Kangaroo was known internally as the Blackburn RT-1, which stood for Reconnaissance Torpedo Type 1. Its development was prompted by the decision of the Air Board to prioritise the use of land planes in its maritime patrols. This decision was in part due to the growing power and efficiency of aero engines, which allowed aircraft to fly faster and further. Up until this point, most maritime patrol aircraft were float planes, as deploying the aircraft from the water, rather than an airfield in land, represented the saving of time and fuel. But this also meant that a patrol mission could be scrubbed by poor weather, as unsurprisingly, wood and fabric biplanes didn't exactly have much in the way of sea keeping. This would be somewhat rectified later on by the construction of metal-hulled flying boats and all-metal float planes, but for the moment the Air Board were resigned to launching most of their naval patrols from the safety of dry land. In converting the sea-based Blackburn GP to the land-based Blackburn Kangaroo, various changes were made to the design of the aircraft. The floats were replaced by a four-wheeled undercarriage arranged in two pairs with fixed axles. Now these were connected to the structure supporting the engine nacelles to better distribute the impact forces of landing. For reasons never fully explained, the decision was made to not install any kind of shock absorbers, and the only cushioning provided would come from the tyres. As the original Blackburn GP was designed to absorb the harsh impacts of water landing, it was probably assumed that landing on an airfield was a less strenuous affair, and the shock absorbers were a needless addition of weight. Though the general construction of the wooden fabric airframe was retained, subtle differences could be found that set the kangaroo apart. The engine nacelles were raised to sit in the gap of the wings, rather than upon the lower one. The side-mounted radiators were replaced by frontal honeycomb-style units. The top decking of the fuselage was deleted, further slimming down its lines. Most of the metal fittings were now machined, rather than being built up from sheet metal. The rudder was increased in size, now boasting a rounded trailing edge, and the pylons that braced the overhang of the upper wings were changed from triangular to square in shape. Like the Blackburn GP, the Kangaroo was ideally suited to carrying a large torpedo, thanks to its divided undercarriage, but it was never used in this capacity. Instead, it would carry four 230-pound bombs, or a single 520-pound bomb, suspended beneath the fuselage, and four smaller bombs could also be attached to racks mounted on the lower longerons. These would be aimed by the front gunner, who made use of a Royal Naval Air Service Mark II A bombsite. The defensive armament, used by both the front and rear gunners, remained the same, a single Lewis gun for each. But additional radio equipment was given to the rear gunner, who served as radio operator, to facilitate nighttime operations. Most of the modifications made to the Kangaroo had the benefit of reducing its empty weight by about 500 pounds, or 230 kilos. Additionally, it was to come with far more powerful engines, with the Rolls-Royce Falcon 2s producing 250 horsepower each, compared to the 190 horsepower Rolls-Royce engines of the Blackburn GP. It was with high hopes, therefore, that Blackburn flight-tested its new aircraft towards the end of 1917, 
and on the 3rd of January 1918, it went to the experimental station at Martlesham Heath for its official trials. Here, it competed against the Avro 529, which was a perplexing decision, as the Avro had less powerful engines, was smaller, and sat in a completely different weight class. In the end, the results of the initial trials were inconclusive, not because of the disparity between the two aircraft, but because the kangaroo's rigid undercarriage decided to imitate the German economy of 1918 and completely collapse. This resulted in significant damage and brought the trials to a temporary halt whilst urgent repair work was carried out. Despite the continued bad luck of Blackburn, whose chief had clearly offended some sort of aviation deity, the kangaroo was accepted into service. Of the original planned order for 50 floatplane Blackburn GPs, approximately 20 had been under construction, and it was these that were converted over to the Blackburn kangaroo. Following the Martlesham reports, a few changes were made before their completion. The front gunner station was raised to allow easier operation, the landing gear received shock absorbers to prevent the whole thing deflating like a souffle upon landing, and the fuselage structure was reinforced to counter a highly disconcerting tendency of the whole thing to twist and bow during steep turns. Along with this, the last 15 kangaroos completed would also benefit from the upgraded 270 horsepower Rolls-Royce Falcon 3. Unfortunately, Blackburn was still a relatively small company at the time, and this production order represented a significant challenge. A lack of manpower, combined with a general shortage of suitable spruce wood, meant that the kangaroos, initially destined for the Admiralty, and then given over to the Royal Flying Corps, were not in fact ready until the RFC had turned into the RAF. Still, contrary to some opinions at the time that Blackburns were good on paper but not so much in practice, some of the kangaroos did indeed do themselves credit during their brief service in the last year of the war. Ten were operated by 240 Squadron of RAF Seton Carew, with their primary mission being maritime reconnaissance and patrol. Between the 1st of May 1918 and the armistice, they flew more than 600 hours over the North Sea. Some of these sorties involved convoy protection, and the kangaroos sighted 12 U-boats, attacked 11, sank one UC-70 off Runswick Bay, and damaged another four, which wasn't bad at all considering how difficult it was to keep these old planes steady. Following the armistice, the disposals board put all Blackburn kangaroos up for sale. The Blackburn company had planned to buy back all of their kangaroos, but they had competition. The Graham White Aviation Company purchased three aircraft and flew them back to their facility at Hendon. Here, they were stripped off their military equipment and converted into eight-seat passenger aircraft for joyriding. Unfortunately, two of the three would be wrecked within a few months. A combination of poor luck, inexperienced pilots, and in one case a recalcitrant engine. But these occurred without any loss of life, and the third aircraft carried on for the next 18 months, dropping parachutists, giving demonstration flights to foreign delegations, and of course entertaining the general public. In another part of the country, Blackburn had purchased eight kangaroos and had also modified them into civil transports. The central part of the fuselage was extended vertically to facilitate the installation of a large glazed cabin. This accommodated seven passengers, and an eighth passenger, ideally one with a strong constitution, could be housed in the forward gunner station, which had been modified with glass sides so that said passenger had both protection and unobstructed views of the outside world. This modification was not universal, but it does appear to represent the majority of the aircraft that Blackburn had purchased back. In April 1919, Blackburn formed a subsidiary known as the North Sea Aerial Navigation Company to run full commercial services. The first of these was inaugurated on the 10th of May, flying freight from Gosport to Leeds, and others quickly followed. These early services were very sporadic, and often unprofitable, but like many others at the time, they paved the way for more successful commercial enterprises in the mid-1920s. The most ambitious commercial service undertaken by the kangaroo was that between Britain and the Netherlands. 
In 1919, the Dutch had been impressed by the Blackburn kangaroo when three visited the country for the first air traffic exhibition, held at Amsterdam. The first official flight between the two countries was in fact a charter flight to counter the effects of a dockyard strike in the Netherlands. On the 6th of March 1920, Blackburn's chief test pilot, R.W. Kenworthy, took off from England with a £1,000 cargo load of fashionable ladies' clothing. The plan was to deliver the goods and return to England with an inbound cargo of dyes. But upon seeing their strike being circumvented by the Blackburn kangaroo, the dockyard workers became understandably hostile, and Kenworthy had to hastily fly off to Soesterberg Aerodrome and seek military protection. When the kangaroo wasn't incurring the ire of underpaid, overworked dockmen, armed with a frightening array of blunt instruments, it was bouncing between its home aerodrome in Bruff, the customs aerodrome in Lim, and its destination aerodrome in Amsterdam. The service only lasted for a month or so, as the requirement to fly to a customs stop and then depart the country added so much cost to the endeavour that it never actually turned a profit. Still, during this short time, the service flew 20,000 miles and carried some 18,000 pounds of freight and around 1,200 passengers. Not bad at all for 1920. Not all kangaroos were used for commercial operations during this time. One of the kangaroos owned by Blackburn, retained as a training aircraft with tandem cockpits, was sold to the Peruvian Army Air Service. Along with an Avro 504K, it was intended to be used to train Peruvian pilots as part of a military cooperation mission between Britain and Peru in 1922. But after this endeavour was terminated later that year, there was nobody left in the country who was qualified to fly it, and the aircraft was scrapped in Peru later on in 1923. Though the kangaroo certainly contributed to the pioneering attempts at early commercial air travel, one of the more memorable parts of its history was the ill-fated attempt at a long-distance record. Appropriately, the Blackburn kangaroo had been selected by Lieutenant Valdemar Rendell to fly from England to Australia. It was one of four aircraft competing for the £10,000 prize, which was to be awarded to whoever was the first to fly a British aircraft, with an Australian crew, from the former country to the latter. As we already know from my video covering the Vickers Vimy, the Blackburn Kangaroo was not successful in this endeavour. The aircraft came to grief in the Mediterranean, not due to any apparent defects, but supposedly due to sabotage. The Australian crew twice complained that the magnetos had been tampered with, and on the 8th of December, a pipe feeding oil to the port engine fractured. The kangaroo was 80 miles out from Crete at the time, and the crew just made it back on one engine. But, landing downwind and low on power, the aircraft ran over a small ditch, punctured a tyre, slewed around, and ran up an embankment. Upon assessing the damage, it appeared that the broken pipe had been bent back and forth several dozen times, leading to a weakening of the metal that led to the failure. Though the aircraft was generally undamaged, failed attempts to telegraph home for a replacement engine led to it being abandoned in Crete. It was housed in a local museum for some time, but after the German invasion of Crete in World War II, it was supposedly hidden away in a cave for preservation. But after the war, nobody had ever managed to find it again, and it's a mystery that has never been fully solved. The final years of the Blackburn Kangaroos would see them back in service with the RAF. When the RAF Reserve School was established, the surviving kangaroos were fitted with dual controls in tandem cockpits and used for training flights at their home airfield at Bruff. This they did between 1924 and March 1929, when they were finally laid up in a hangar and gradually scrapped over the following 12 months. Discounting the possibility of a kangaroo airframe rotting away in a cave in Crete, only one part of its history survives today, which is a four-blade propeller that sits on display at the Leeds Bradford Airport. Unfortunately, I can't find any photos of said display, but apparently it's there, and it represents the first Blackburn aircraft, other than the pioneering Mercury, that could probably be considered an overall success. 
As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the supporters over on Patreon. Unfortunately, a behind the scenes cock up on my part has prevented the release of the Q&A video for this month, but hopefully it should be out in the first week or so of February. I've also been having some internet issues this week as well, so if a video is a day or two late, that is why. A big thank you as well to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier members, and a special shout out to MV, who is the newest member of this special group. Thank you all so, so much for your continued support, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.